He's he has authored or co-authored um, several books on California politics, and maybe you can talk a little bit about them. One of them is A Practitioner's Guide to Lobbying and Advocacy in California. He also teaches as an adjunct professor at the Univers University of the Pacific's McGeorge School of Law. He does a lot of things, in other words, uh, and has been around politics for quite some time. And I thought it'd be really interesting to hear you know, his take. We talk to politicians, we, you know, we talk to legislators, the governor's office, et cetera, uh, policy experts, but haven't really talked to lobbyists, and, and they're, they're a critical part of the legislative process. So we're really delighted that, that Chris is here to talk to us about that. So I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to ask him several questions, uh, and then we can open it up to Q&A. If you want to ask uh, Chris some questions, just put it in the chat, and we'll get your questions answered. Okay? So welcome again, Chris. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me today, Mark. So listen, um, you know, we've talked about this before, but um, you know, the legislative process is 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 pretty uh, pretty complicated. Um, but you know, a lot of times folks don't really know what's going on. And, and I think it was Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis uh, famously opined that sunlight is the best disinfectant for political corruption. We've seen some stuff recently uh, concerning political corruption. The question is, what if anything can be done or should be done by state government to make it more transparent? It seems like. Uh, uh, government transparency is something that has bipartisan support. So here's the question. If it's got all this support, why isn't it happening? Well, I think there's a fair amount of transparency that's <clears throat> required by our state constitution. Uh, to be fair, there's only limited public engagement when it comes to state legislation. People are much more aware of what our federal Congress is doing and, and often their local city council or board of supervisors, I think less so at the state government level. The other thing, as you know, Mark, the Capitol Press Corps uh, here in- I was Sacramento, just gonna ask you about that. Yeah, they've definitely been reduced in number. So with less coverage, you know, transparency, some of that is lost. And frankly, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, really, caused uh, transparency to take a hit because there were so few people around the state capitol and so few or number of uh, reporters who were in Sacramento as well during that time, unfortunately. You know, one of the things I've, I've seen uh, over time as we host uh, the, our TV show and our, our radio show is that politicians and bureaucrats are increasingly reluctant to come on. We get we'll get policy experts from the PPIC or the LAO, but for example, uh, politicians, unless you know they think it's a friendly forum, they're not going to come on. Uh, we actually had a situation in the last couple of years where state agencies. We had one of uh, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services that's taking care of the care courts, which is now being rolled out. We asked them several times just to come on and explain the program. Wouldn't come on. We asked the most recent state auditor. We've had the state, the last two previous state auditors have been on many of our shows. Yeah. We asked the new state auditor to come on to just talk about what they do. Wouldn't come on the program, which really surprised me. That's um, amazing to me as well and disappointing. Is is that is that kind of a product of the kind of our hyper-partisan political times where people are afraid that if they go on to any kind of public affairs programming, that it's going to be gotcha? Uh, and so they just avoid it altogether? I think there definitely is some of that. Um, I know many of my colleagues in the lobby core here in Sacramento uh, are particularly reluctant to talk to the press, even you know, so-called off the record. <clears throat> We've had two instances where uh, one of my colleagues in, in, in the lobbying profession here um, said, quote unquote, he didn't realize he was talking to a member of the press. and. Um, they did a critical piece where, frankly, he fed or made statements that obviously were good fodder for, uh, you know, the press to relate. And so that caused quite a stir. And I think the general consensus was, see, this is why lobbyists should never talk to the press. Uh, I think government officials, however, uh, obviously, who are paid with taxpayer dollars, and are supposed to be doing the public's good, uh, the, the, the public service should never uh, decline, whether it's a favorable or unfavorable 
uh, potential audience. And But look, to be fair, there are a lot of folks in the press nationally at the state level, certainly, who you know, are often critical about elected officials, appointed officials, and they're looking for that news grabbing uh, headline. And so that gives pause to a lot of people to appear. Again, I see a distinction between private sector and public sector people. Yeah, no, it's, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think they are public servants. And I think the answer yeah. is, yeah, it, it, you know, you should appear and answer questions, uh, particularly in a forum like ours, which is nonpartisan. Um, I was I've been surprised at the reaction, and frankly, a little dismayed. I think I, I can say this freely now that that I'm retiring. I guess I can I can I don't have to incur any favor um, with with any of these you politicians and the bureaucrats. Now, Mark, huh? What's that? You don't have to watch your words any longer. Don't have to watch my words so much. I mean, I think was one of the things that happens when you're trying to get guests on a program uh, to talk about policy, whether it's a legislator or a bureaucrat is you're, you're, you're worried about burning your bridges, right? That you want to, and so there's this game that's being played. And so I, I think that as I'm leaving this position, I think it's really important um, that the public be informed on what's going on and that that politicians and bureaucrats should be held to account when they don't appear. Um, because I think they're really, they're uh, being very disrespected, frankly, of, of their constituents uh, in, in my mind. But I, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent there no, just because I, I it agree. bothers me that, that, that this happens. It shouldn't be happening. You know, Mark, I often say that uh, uh, a, a free and active press are a critical aspect of our democracy, uh, not only as a check on public officials, but also just informing uh, the readers or the listeners, whether it's TV, radio, or print TV, uh, sorry, print media, uh, folks have to provide them the critical information they need to accurately and timely report to, again, their readers and listeners. Yeah, and, it's, and what you mentioned about the, the Capitol Press Corps, I mean, it really has been decimated. Now, there have been, you know, uh, folks like Cal Matters that, that, have, that have emerged that have kind of pick, take, taken up the slack on that. But um, that is very concerning that that there is there is there aren't as many uh, reporters as there once were. Let me let me transition a little bit. I want to ask you to get back into lobbying again and talk about where the money is all going. I mean, you typically think about money in politics it going kind of in a, in a one direction: Republican money going to you know corporations, uh, Democratic money going to unions. Um, but sometimes that really doesn't happen. Sometimes you know unions might give money to to, to corporations, and and Republicans might give money. To, to unions or, or, to, or to Democratic candidates, rather. Um, is, is that kind of like a person playing both sides saying, well, listen, I'm in California, for example, um, I, I'm in California and I represent uh, a co corporation. I know that in this particular uh, district, uh, legislative district, Republicans just have no chance of success. So what I'm gonna look for is the moderate Democratic candidate that I can back in a primary. Does, is that happening? Uh, most definitely, uh, I would say that it probably doesn't happen with my friends in in labor or environmental groups. Um, they pretty much stick with uh, Democratic. Did, did that have, well, that's because I mean Republicans generally are just don't have much sway at the state capitol these days. But back you know twenty thirty years ago when they did, would would they would would unions back or environmentalists back a Republican the more moderate Republican candidate? Yeah, every once in a while. And you do see that from time to time. I know that, for example, um, some assembly Republicans who have uh, been in a uh, union before, like in law enforcement or EMS, <clears throat> they've enjoyed some support from uh, some limited uh, organized labor groups. But frankly, Mark, that's more of a phenomenon in the business community, uh, 25 years ago, when I started lobbying in Sacramento, it was already alive and well. And that's when the uh, partisan composition of the two houses of the legislature were much closer in parity. In fact, you may recall in 1994 for one year, Republicans actually had a slight majority in the California State Assembly. Today, uh, as I like to say, there are super duper uh, Democrat majorities in both houses, 62 out of 80 assembly in the assembly and 32 out of 40 in the Senate. So the number of, you know, 
business organizations and businesses that support Democratic candidates for state office has only grown exponentially as Democratic numbers have grown in the California State Senate and State Assembly. You know, what's particularly interesting, I think, is is public safety, you know, police and fire. They have almost like, um, we're almost like Moses through the parted sea when it comes to politics, because Democrats support them because they're unions and Republicans support them because they're public safety. I mean, they've got, you know, they hit the sweet spot um, when it comes to political support. Let me yeah, ask you about that. Do quite well. Yeah, you're right. Um, let me ask you about this. Um, in terms of uh, what's happening with lobbying, how do you see them helping or lobbyists like yourself helping or others maybe hurting the political process? Well, it may sound self-serving, but I, uh, as you know, I teach. I just finished my uh, ninth year at McGeorge School of Law, teaching a lawmaking in California uh, course. Uh, where we do bring in the media, uh, governor's office, uh, and other groups that play roles uh, and influence or affect the legislative process. Uh, one of the class sessions is naturally dedicated to the role of lobbyists in the legislative process. Look, whether at the federal, state, or local levels, I think they play important roles in terms of education and advocacy. In most instances, we think of lobbyists only advocating for or against, you know, legislation in the legislative branch or regulations in the executive branch, but there's a lot of education that goes on, and naturally, it's sometimes easier to talk with somebody from whatever, the CPA Society, the Forestry Association, or the State Chamber of Commerce than trying to solicit potentially dozens of businesses in those different areas. Same thing on the labor side or environmental side. It's a lot easier to pick up the phone and call the lobbyists at the California Labor Federation than perhaps reaching out to a dozen or more individual labor union members. It's not that uh, you can or should ignore individuals, but for a lobbyist who may represent clients, it's a, it's a lot easier to deal with that individual uh, and get information or find out from them or hear how an industry or a profession uh, feels good or bad about a, a, a bill or a regulation, for example. Now, obviously, you have responsibilities in that role. Uh, you know, and I think, frankly, despite there being, what, maybe 1,200 registered lobbyists here uh, at the state capitol, there's really three or 400 at most who are here day to day. And I think that uh, the good ones are known and the bad ones are known. Likewise, elected officials and their staff, once you start working with them, you realize here are the hardworking ones, here are the folks who, you know, read the bills and analyses and hear from both sides before they make decisions. I mean, it's easy to figure out uh, who are good folks and who, who are not so good folks. And hopefully you get your information from trustworthy sources. You know, isn't that particularly true with, when it was, well, well, term limits have been modified, but any type of term limits yeah. kind of denies you the opportunity as a politician to kind of get up to speed and become an expert in an area. I mean, you, you're just beginning to become an expert and you're looking for the next office to run for. Yeah, it's, uh, look, my feeling generally is is that the best term limits is getting the electorate to get out and vote you know if you're not being well served by your local state or federal representative then vote him or her out of office but until that happens you know some term limits probably make sense i still think at 12 years lifetime uh, is too short look i don't believe that somebody should be in elected office federal state or local you know, for a 30 or 40 year career, that doesn't make sense. But 12 years uh, in one house or a combination of the two in the California legislature, I still think is too short a period of time, maybe. Just just as a, as a footnote, you know, Ken Matty was in office for 28 years between yeah. the assembly and the Senate. Um, and he was viewed as a very effective legislator. Um, let me ask you this though, you know, a lot of people equate uh, lobbying with, with money. And they equate, they equate money with political success, but that's not always true, is it? I mean, there aren't there a lot of instances where a lot of money gets thrown at at, at something and it, it's not successful. Well, two things. One is it, it can backfire. 
uh, it might might draw undue and uh, you know unseemly attention to an issue or a bill. Uh, but also, as I know from my friends who represent, for example, strictly nonprofit organizations or local governments or special districts, none of whom give campaign contributions and uh, many of whom have tremendous success in representing their clients, uh, we know that you know money is not the only way. Policy, I think, in the end, wins out in more circumstances than not. Uh, in terms of my first comment, look, I, over the last 25 years, I've seen plenty of instances where big moneyed interests have thrown a lot of, you know, campaign contributions around and frankly spent money on lobbyists and grassroots firms and PR folks and all of that only to have it uh, basically blow up in their face, so to speak. Um, and it's brought a lot of negative attention and uh, views that oh, they're trying to buy success in the legislative process. So I think many times, uh, you know, being overt about spending money in the legislative process has been a negative. You know, let me ask you a little bit about the kind of the legislative process and what's going on. And we talk a lot about the hyper-partisan nature of politics. It, it wasn't always so, right? I mean, you go back to the days of of Ken, Ken Maddie in the 1990s and Willie Brown. I mean, two very different folks politically, but they got along pretty well. They, they, they trusted each other. Um, and that resulted in, you know, the ability to get things done. Um, are, are we ever going to see those days again? I don't think so at the, in the foreseeable future. I think it's both a national and a state problem, um, especially as the Look, even though there's uh, greater parity in numbers, obviously both the House, the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate uh, only have a partisan difference of literally uh, a handful of seats. I think fewer than 10 on the U.S. House side and, and what, two or three on the U.S. Senate. Uh, so even with greater parity in numbers, you still have a very polarized and very negative uh, at least perception of what's going on amongst our elected officials at the federal level. You know, when I first started lobbying in the mid 1990s, it was at the very tail end of the careers of folks like Ken Maddy, Willie Brown, uh, David Roberti was the pro tem in the Senate. And yes, um, the way you describe it really was the case. First of all, even when they were debating issues in committee or on the floors, um, there was far less hyperbole, less partisanship in those comments. But even so, after five o'clock, if you will, any forms of partisanship quickly ended. And those folks, I mean, I remember the first um, lobbying job I got, uh, my, uh, the chief lobbyist was a fellow Democrat like myself, but the head of the organization was a former Republican state senator a, a moderate one by today's um, standards, no doubt. But one of his best friends in the legislature was none other than, you know, Democrat, clearly Democrat, Speaker Willie Brown. And they went to the movies uh, almost once a week on Tuesday evenings. They, they never talked politics. They just spent time together as friends and watched movies and stuff. You know, there was just a very different... Uh, approach to things. And it really was in the late 90s that I noticed that <clears throat> more partisan shift took place. I remember in the state Senate, the individual who replaced Ken Maddy as the Senate Republican leader, uh, he got up and um, the new Democratic, of course, President Pro Tem of the Senate was being elected and he voted no. And up to that point, basically, whoever the majority party chose as their leader would become the pro tem and everybody would vote unanimously. And I remember asking him and this Republican from Southern California, he told me, I didn't come to Sacramento to vote for a Democrat. So even though as a collegial matter, they always did that, that's where it really stopped in that house, for example. Now at different times that has come back and you've seen unanimous support for other pro tems to be elected, but you know it was 20, 25 years ago at least in Sacramento that 
you start you started seeing much more partisanship taking place and i think it's only gotten worse so do you think a you know for democracy so it, it kind of leads to the question do you think collegiality is really a important part of the political process and then maybe from that also concept of integrity i mean i talked to willie brown once we we did uh done fundraisers in sacramento for our students and, and yeah. willie brown has often emceed them frankly and i asked him i said why are you coming to sacramento from san francisco to do a fundraiser for a central valley uh public policy institute that probably is going to end up funding scholarships for a lot of republican legislators okay. they said he talked about how much he admired ken maddie and his integrity so those two aspects, which I think are often forgotten, it talks about money in politics or the hyper na uh, hyper partisan nature of politics. But I think people forget that effective politicians really have a view with a high level of integrity and collegiality. They're able to to not make it personal. Well, and collegiality, Mark, does not mean giving up any of your core beliefs or selling out your district, for example. It is the approach that you take. And I think that the legislative process at the state or federal level should be collegial. They should be in an effort to address the public policy issues that address, uh, that affect um, you know, constituents, the citizens of the state, uh, the citizens of the United States, as well as the state of California. That's the ultimate goal. Um, you know, legislators, when they come to Sacramento, should think about what is good for the state as the whole. But, you know, look, I may be a little Pollyannish or naive. I figured, I always said, if I ever ran for office, I would undoubtedly be a one-termer because I'd alienate everybody uh, in trying to do what was right. Uh, but let's be fair. You know, politicians are politicians. Uh, they want to remain a politician, and so they've got to be careful, and sometimes they have to be partisan and, uh, you know, to appeal to those who are going to vote uh, for them and to reelect them to office, for example. Let me ask you a question. Um, okay. Have you ever crossed the aisle, as it were, and work with someone who would not necessarily be a natural ally on, on a project? Oh, I do it all the time. I mean... Look, I mainly represent some some public sector entities, but primarily my clientele in Sacramento are uh, businesses. So I, I mainly deal with the business community uh, are my clients. And so I have to reach across the aisle, so to speak, in everything I do, whether it's with my fellow lobbying colleagues or you know legislators of both parties in order to get things done in Sacramento for my clients. I remember... 15, 20 years ago, when I was doing primarily tax and uh, judiciary committee, legal reform type issues. And there was a guy, he represented um, the organization that was funded by labor groups that, for lack of a better description, opposed business community stuff on the tax side, sought increases in taxes, corporate taxes, property taxes, et cetera. So naturally, the business community and this organization would do battle all the time. And I remember talking to some colleagues and I said, well, I talked to Lenny. He was the chief lobbyist for them. And they're like, what? what? Why did you talk to him? Uh, well, what do you mean? Uh, you know, he's the leader of the, the opposition to most of our stuff. So I was trying to talk to him about this particular bill and see if there was any way for us to collaborate on things. And a number of my colleagues were like, my God, why would you even talk to the opposition, you know, type approach? I think that's my been my philosophy uh, since day one, uh, that you've got to collaborate with your with your colleagues or, you know, legislators and staff of both parties in order to get anything done and put together the best possible product. Yeah, we have a, we had a congressman, I don't know if you remember, uh, Cal Dooley, uh, moderate Democrat. And apparently at one point, um, he actually was on the well of the House, and he actually went up to a Republican and shook his hand, and he got all kinds of grief uh, when he had a meeting with his caucus for doing that. So it's it's like um, it's it's it, it did change over the last twenty or thirty years. Let me let me ask you this, and it kind of gets to the same thing that you know this whole issue of compromise. Um, it used to be that people understood that politics was the art of compromise. You're not going to get a hundred percent of what you want. You cut the best deal you can for your side, and and move on and, and fight another day. Um, it, now it's like it's a dirty word. Um, and I don't 
understand, and maybe you can help me with this, how do you move legislation forward if you're not willing to compromise? I mean, frankly, a good example is the House, um, where you know the Republicans said we don't want any Democratic votes for, for Speaker. It has to be all Republican votes. I don't know. I'm looking at that and saying, well, wait a second. If you do that, then you're you're giving in to a to the most extreme group uh, part of your of your group. If you went across the aisle and captured some moderates, then you wouldn't have to listen to the extreme of of your of your side. And that goes on both sides, by the way. It happened to be a Republican dealing with this, uh, Kevin McCarthy, but it could go the other way as well. I mean, it, have we forgotten how to compromise? Yeah. Uh... Well, it's funny you said, because I was thinking to, my, to myself, I think that compromise has become a dirty word. You know, uh, a few moments ago, I said, uh, you don't, to compromise or to strike a deal does not mean that you have to give up your ideology or, again, run roughshod over your constituents or, you know, anything like that. It means trying to find a middle ground, but I think with the hyper uh, partisanship at both the federal and state levels, compromise is viewed as weakness. And those who are in control of the levers of power don't want to compromise. In other words, today's stand, when I first started lobbying, a I hate to even say this, but a quarter century ago, compromise was not viewed negatively. And, it, you know, people tried, legislators, lobbyists tried to put together the best package. I think today the belief is you only compromise when you don't have the votes. So if I, legislator X, have the votes to pass a bill through the legislative process, I have no incentive to compromise because I can get through this bill in its current form. Who cares that, that there's opposition? Who cares that there are no votes? As long as it won't stop my bill or defeat it, I don't have to compromise. Well, and you see that certainly in the California legislature with the supermajority the Democrats have in both houses. Why do you have to compromise with the Republican? I mean, because you don't need their votes. Um, and you might have to deal with some moderate Democrats, Mark, maybe. As you know, Mark, up until the voters adopted in 2010, Prop 25, we were one of three states that required a supermajority, a two-thirds vote of both houses in order to adopt the state budget. Now, I don't disagree with any critics who said it caused a delay in every budget. They were rarely done by July 1st, the start of our fiscal year, and you know, some people leveraged their budget vote for non-budget related things, whether it was a gubernatorial appointment or some other bill. I don't disagree with all those criticisms. But once Prop 25 passed, Republicans who weren't in the super minority at that time, <laughs> or super duper today, still up to that point, could have and should have played some role in the legislative process. Today, I think Democratic legislators will tell you they don't need to consult. They don't want to consult with Republicans. Why? They don't need their votes for the budget. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean that this is a good budget that you're adopting or putting together. At the very least, you know, ideas should be solicited Input should be welcome from all sectors, whether they're on your side or not. But I think that's the general philosophy today is if I don't need your vote, then I don't need to talk to you, whether that's an interest group, a lobbyist, or a fe fellow legislator. And I think that's a sad commentary on our, direct, on our democracy here in California. Well, so let me ask you this. What do you think should be done to improve the legislative process? What kinds of things would you recommend you know, be, happen? Well, I guess in my mind, uh, the things that I would like to change or see changed are things that, you know, frankly, 
may or may they don't really necessarily impact the general public, if you will. The things that I am most frustrated with as a student of the process of the process and for someone who loves the institution, the legislature, government, I believe in its benefit to society, uh, who respects uh, participation in the legislative process. The things that don't sit well with me are first and foremost, I believe our legislature has become a, simply a bill factory. And I say that in a derogatory manner, to be fair, not in a positive way. Look, Article 4, Section 1 of the state constitution grants the lawmaking power to the legislature with concurrent power uh, with the people in terms of the initiative and referendum. But of the three branches of government, the legislature's lawmaking. So, of course, they should be doing lawmaking. I mean, that's their main job, of course. My point is, is that we're, we're, they're sending more than a thousand bills every single year to the governor. The governor signing this one, the prior one, you know, roughly 85% of them. I mean, they're adding 800, 900 bills every single year. And A, I don't think we need that many. But more than that, they're introducing 2,300 to 2,500 bills every single year. So anywhere from, you know, 4,600 to 5,000 bills every two-year session. They can't do them justice. Is a quicker way is is a quicker way for a lobbyist if they don't like a bill that's being considered, uh, just go straight to the governor's office and try to get a veto. Not no, not today because you know you've got a democratic governor and a democratic legislature. I but you've got a democratic governor that has other aspirations, and so if you can point out to them, hey, this is not going to you're not going to look good, you know, in in a few years if you're going to run for president if you support this to come back yeah. and bite you so i'm sure that's a potential avenue but that's not a guarantee and <clears throat> you know i'm sure some people scoff at it but i still believe that sure some politics will come into a few signatures and vetoes but the vast majority are policy or fiscal grounds justifying the signature or the veto i think and you can't ignore the process, even if you know you're likely to lose in the legislature. You can't have a bill that goes down to the governor with near, you know, super majority votes in both both houses. That makes it harder for a governor to veto a bill. So I, I would not recommend it as a practice to ignore the legislature and just try to get it. And, pro and probably also not win you any friends friends among those legislators if you do an end run to the governor's office. They expect you to come to them first, I would assume. They do. And, and you know, even if they don't entertain your amendments, they, sp they still expect that level of courtesy that you go and at least talk through your opposition or your concerns and present them with amendments. Now, don't hold your breath that any of it will get accepted, but Nonetheless, yes, that is a reasonable expectation of legislators. By the way, I would like to encourage folks if they got any questions uh, to put them in the chat so we can we can ask uh, our guest. You know, uh, Chris, I was thinking when you were talking about um, compromise. I do a lot of work as as a federal mediator, and That's one of the things that we sometimes see is one party is reluctant to agree to mediation because they see it as a sign of weakness, um, an acknowledgement that maybe they did something wrong. And so even though that's probably the most cost-effective and efficient way to resolve the dispute, they're hesitant. And so you, I guess you could see the same thing in politics where you know, people are hesitant to compromise or feeling they're gonna, they're gonna be viewed as, as weak or something. Right. No, I mean, I think I've, I've mentioned that. I, I do, today, in today's legislature, I think compromise is not viewed in a positive way. And again, it means that you don't have, you the legislator, you the, interest group behind that particular bill, you don't have the votes to pass the bill. And that's the reason why you're talking compromise. By the way, we've got, we've got a question. It's a good question about um, how concerned are you about making it tougher to put a proposition on the ballot? Do you see uh, the Democratic supermajority fracturing or eating itself? So, uh, what was the second part? The second part is, do you see the Democratic supermajority fracturing? 
Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, Democrats are not monolithic because there's a Bay Area Democrat is very different than a Valley sure. uh, Democrat. So do you see that splintering? Um, and the other question was, the other part of that question was, how do you feel about the propositions on the ballot? Should we make it tougher to get propositions on the ballot? Yeah, well, definitely two distinct questions in my yeah. mind. Um, as to the first, no, I don't think anything should be done. Uh, I know that some people view direct democracy that was obviously, uh, you know, proposed by then Governor Hiram Johnson in the early 1900s and the voters elected the, I'm sorry, the voters uh, adopted uh, the three forms of direct democracy uh, to our state constitution. Uh, and I think that those are very important. Now, they were originally intended to address the power of the, uh, you know, owners of the uh, train industry, obviously. But isn't that the argument today? The railroad that, industry. What, Mark? Isn't that the argument today that it's kind of been flipped? That it was originally designed to kind of curtail the power of, of corporations and, and, and yes, money was... interests. And now what you have is propositions that are being supported by those money, you know, have a billionaire or whatever get behind a proposition. Yeah, I, that's what I was uh, going to get to, which is, you know, it started as an anti-special interest. And today it's probably viewed as less a citizen measure as a special interest. Unfortunately, that deals with the cost of putting them on the ballot, i.e. signature gathering. and the Which is not cheap, by the way. I mean, what's the cost of, of getting a signature? When those people are sitting outside the, the food store and trying to get your signature, how much are they getting for every signature that, that they get? Well, it depends on the time of year and what okay. the timeline is, i.e. how much time before is, the deadline reaches for them to put in the signatures. Obviously, the later and the closer to deadline periods, the more they can charge. So uh, at the best time, it's, you know, five or six bucks uh, a signature. And later on, it can be more than $15 a signature. So, uh, and obviously we are one of the most expensive media markets in the nation. And any initiative or referendum for that matter is voted on by the statewide electors. So it's very costly. So Yes, you've got to have a moneyed interest behind either proposing a new law through the initiative or trying to overturn one by the legislature, the referendum process. So, yeah, in many ways it can become the, the less of a citizen driven, but that doesn't mean you should curtail it because ultimately the true purpose, no matter, no matter who's promoting it or financing it, the real purpose of direct democracy is to be a check on our government, whether it's the legislative branch, the executive branch, it's the citizens' power to keep a check on their elected officials. Uh, and you remember, I cited earlier Article 4, Section 1, which is the legislative branch of government. And again, it says the lawmaking power is given to the legislature, but the people retain for themselves the power of initiative and referendum. So we, the people, share the lawmaking power with our state elected officials. Couldn't you? Uh, could so you argue that? Changes. Yeah. Could you argue that that process is kind of maybe almost the last stand for conservative or Republican uh, policies? If they, because they, the, the governor's office is Democratic, the legislature is Democratic. That the only chance that uh, Republicans or conservatives have in really affecting policy is through the proposition or initiative process. Yes, although my hesitancy is because, again, as a student of the institution and the process and of government, uh, I hate to view direct democracy in a partisan manner. Mm -hmm. Your statement is true, uh, but again, I would, I'm would i loath to describe direct democracy as favoring or an avenue for one or the other, because well, I would say the same thing if we had supermajority Republicans and a Republican governor. I feel the same way about direct democracy. And there's plenty of examples. There's plenty of examples of union-backed propositions and initiatives. So um, it, it does go both ways. But I kind of see that a little bit as as kind of the last avenue for for conservatives and Republicans who want to effectuate state policy in some way. I think there's a lot of frustration um, on their part. Let me let me ask you this. 
do you are you gonna, you think we're going to see a lot of uh, propositions and initiatives on the ballot in in twenty four? Uh, yes, and don't forget, uh, originally, uh, two measures placed on the ballot by the legislature, um, SCA 2 by Ben Allen to repeal some affordable housing stuff, uh, and ACA 5 by Lowe to remove the um, same-sex marriage prohibition that was, that was struck down by the federal courts. Those were on the March ballot. Those got moved by statute to November, uh, as did ACA 13, a measure backed by the governor and the uh, Democratic leaders to uh, increase the threshold. Well, basically to require any measure uh, on the con uh, to amend the Constitution to increase a vote threshold must pass by that same higher vote threshold in order to go into effect. That's That also would have been on March, but was moved to November. So the March 5th primary, we have only one measure that's been designated Prop 1, and that's the, the Governor's Mental Health Services Act modifications. Uh, so we'll only see one ballot uh, measure to vote on March 5th. We'll have at a low of three and a high of eight or 10 on the November ballot. And, how, and, and historically, how many end up on the ballot? What's the high watermark? Is it like closer to 20 or something, 18 or 20? Yeah, that was that was a bad election. <laughs> That's where even I, uh, you know, agree with critics who say, what's the legislature doing? They should tackle more of these. Um, so yeah, and we have a question here about um, get up to those numbers. Yeah, we have a question about um, how citizens can better engage their representatives, particularly if they are represented by a member of the other party. And what role? Um, let's see here, what role can uh, lobbyists uh, play in bridging gaps and br and uh, building communication with communities and elected representatives? Um, in terms of citizen engagement, I think it's really the traditional way. I think you should try and visit selectively, of course, your elected representative in his or her district office uh, and, and write or communicate, uh, frankly, by letter is probably the best way to communicate, uh, despite being in the 21st century. Even better than, e better than email. Oh, e emails are not a good way. Uh, they're not a good way because there's so many that come in and, and that's not just the constituent email, just the emails that uh, legislative staffers get internally, you know, in terms of things from the Assembly and Senate Rules Committees and, you know, as an employee that they get and the emails from lobbyists and all, I think it's much harder for a citizen to do that. And Legislators and staff like to see, I was starting to say, despite being a 21st century economy, we're still a lot of paper driven things in the legislative process. Seeing and responding to letters, I think is very beneficial. Uh, they like to see it. They like the letterhead. They like to know that a constituent in their district is writing to them for the important stuff you know, visiting your legislator again in their district office, I think is more valuable than the Capitol one. They're often very pressed for time in the Capitol. They're often running from one meeting to another, if not from one committee to another or committee to floor. So it's a lot harder to get their attention. You're better off trying to meet with them in the district. Don't be a gadfly. You can't write on every issue or contact them on everything but be selective. And I think you'll get greater receptiveness uh, if you weigh in on select things, but it's really the traditional engagement again. In That's it's really interesting. And I, you say that, for example, mail is more persuasive than email. And I totally understand why you're saying that. And also I think it's, it's the effort that who writes a letter these days, if someone's going to take the effort to write a letter, that must be, they're really, this is something that's very important to them. That's a good, that's a good indicator. Yeah. Um, so what about legislators will see them. I mean, email, it's harder. Staff generally doesn't, you know, print out all of them. They'll select a few. They'll say, oh, we got 
15 emails uh, encouraging to vote yes on AB 123. Here's one of them. Letters, they're more often to be put in a bill file or in their binder, many legislators. The other interesting thing is today, the um, basically the, the legislative information service, LIS, that they have that allows them to track bills. They input information like when a constituent or a lobbyist, for that matter, comes and visits them about a bill, they can log in to this system and write a note. So you're staffing Senator, you know, Jones on a bill. Uh, and you could, as a staffer, you could actually put in, uh, you know, on this day, Chris McKaylee representing so-and-so came and visited me on uh, encouraging you to vote for SB 123 for these reasons. And then the legislator in committee or on the floor can not only put pull up the notes from their staff like that, but also if you have the letters, they get uploaded into a system and they can click on it. So they can see like 10 organizations in support of SB 123 and they say, oh, the, you know, moms and dads for apple pie in the Antelope Valley, hmm, I wonder what they said. And the legislator can click on that name and boom, up on their computer screen is the actual PDF version of the letter. Mm. So that's why I say, you know, those types of in-person visits where the staff can make notes or the letter, they can see it right there when they go to vote on a bill. So another part of this question was that how can lobbyists uh, play uh, a role in bridging the gaps between, you know, the communication gaps that exist between maybe communities and their elected representatives? Well, um, you know, those community, look, everybody's represented by a lobbyist somehow, somewhere. Uh, I like to say even lobbyists have their own organization. Uh, we have a very fancy name, IGA, the Institute of Governmental Advocates. Anyways, uh, whether it's, you know, students, when I was a undergrad at UC Davis, I was heavily involved in the UC Student Association. Yeah, we came to Sacramento every once in a while. Um, you know, there's, whether it's representing taxpayers, labor unions, environmentalists, I mean, everybody's got a voice and those people, those organizations should really be the ones who are represented by lobbyists. Either they work for them in-house full-time or they're on contract, which is what I do. I'm what they call a contract lobbyist because we contract with our clients to represent them. So we don't work full-time for somebody. We're not an employee of an organization we work on contract and we should be that voice and help bridge that gap yeah i'm going to ask you um, a question that i sometimes get from students yeah. who are looking for career choices uh -huh. um so so how do you become a lobbyist how did you become a lobbyist well i probably did the non-traditional way i think in most instances um, lobbyists have either worked in the legislative branch most often uh, or in the executive branch or some combination because it allows them to obviously learn the process, a critical thing. They learn about often multiple policy issues, very important. Uh, they get to know people both inside and outside the, the, the business or the, uh, the capital. Uh, so it's important to know people have contacts um, and so really working in the public sector like that is probably your best avenue. Uh, after law school, I started practicing law in an area called political and election law because I thought this would be a great area to combine my love of politics, um, you know, and law. But, and I mean no disrespect for my friends and colleagues in that field, but I found that a lot of it was, you know, advising what form to fill out, where to disclose campaign contributions, et cetera. And the law firm that I worked for the two summers in law school, half the firm did political and election law, and the other half did uh, government law and lobbying. And so I saw, you know, out of the corner of my eye, the people who were doing the government law and lobbying. And so after I decided political election law wasn't really my thing, 
I asked the two lobbyists to <laughs> uh, their advice and they suggested I apply to a trade association, which I ended up doing and ultimately got uh, hired uh, in that uh, trade association to do tax and legal work. And they needed an attorney and they frankly wanted to pay somebody pretty cheap. And, uh, you know, I'd only been a couple of years out of law school. So I think it worked for both of us. But the traditional way is uh, somebody uh, leaves the legislative branch or the executive branch and goes into lobbying most often. Mark. So they're a legislative staffer or something, and, and they do that for five or 10 years or something, and then and, uh, then transition That's over. Exactly right. Yeah. Or, 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 or I suppose, or a legis you are elected and you do, you see a lot of that. Um, yeah, they yeah. Uh, a number of uh, former elected officials who are now lobbyists, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, we have don't have any more questions today. We're we're running up uh, up against the clock here. Is there is there anything you'd like to add about uh, the political process or uh, about your experience? That, there were a couple that came in. Um, do you have any recommendations for teaching students about the behind the scenes aspect? Oh, there, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I hate to do this plug, but you know, there's a. Capital seminars. Um, I do a regulatory advocacy one once a quarter, but Capital Seminars does a program a half a day called Lobbying 101 that teaches people about it. There are some courses offered in a few colleges and law schools. Uh, certainly in McGeorge, they do. Um, on the Kendall Hunt website, there are some books on lobbying in the legislative process. If you put my name in, you can see there and, and you can get them. Uh, several of the books like on lobbying, the proceeds go to the Capital Fellows Program. So as much as I'm plugging my own uh, books, uh, the beneficiaries are, are often uh, the folks who are in the Senate, Senate, Senate Assembly, Judicial and Executive Branch Fellowships. Uh, yeah, my those books on the Kendall Hunt website. Unfortunately, there's so much about the legislature, the legislative process and lobbying at the federal level, which is actually what prompted me. I mean, here in the last couple of years, I've done it and all these years, no one else had done it. I mean, if others had written about the process or state lobbying, I sure as heck would never have done it, frankly. But so there are only a few resources. There is a question here about term limits. Right. And staffing. How's this and, and about how it affects uh, staffing. Uh, yeah, I mean, term uh, limits. Uh, obviously, that came about uh, in 1990 with the voters adoption of Prop 140 term limits and a 40 percent reduction in uh, funding for the legislative branch of government. Unfortunately, I don't think that's the answer. All of that was attributable to efforts to uh, you know, get rid of the self-proclaimed Ayatollah of the Assembly, <laughs> Assembly Speaker Willie Brown at the time. I don't think that's a justification for what was done with either term limits or the 40% cut, but that's it. Yeah, you know, institutional memory is sometimes lost. There are still quite a few staffers, fortunately, particularly in the committees, not so much for legislators themselves, what we call personal staff, meaning they work personally for a legislator as opposed to committee staff who work for the 33 assembly committees and 22 Senate committees. Those folks have much greater stability and are on the job a lot longer. And of course, there are a number of old time uh, lobbyists who have been around, especially some folks who have done it a lot longer than I have, uh, who bring a lot of memory, but it's always impacted because uh, term limits affecting legislators also in turn affect staff because some staff decide that, well, this was the best legislator I'll ever work for. And so I'm going to quit too, or I'm going to go to the private sector or whatever else. So, um, you know, they also mentioned something here about, we, we talked about uh, transparency with elected officials. They also talk here about appointed officials, same argument, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing with the appointed officials, of course, is that there is some insulation, if you will, uh, as opposed to elected who, you know, face the electorate every two years in the assembly, four years in the Senate, or of course, at the federal and local levels, they have their respective terms of office. 
Um, so I think the greater pressure point with the appointed officials is who is their appointing authority. Uh, for example, if you're an agency secretary, a department director, et cetera, in the executive branch, obviously those folks are appointed by the governor. That's why the governor's office, in addition to having what they call their legislative unit, who are, you know, depending on the administration, seven to 10 individuals who are the liaisons per subject matter between the legislative branch and the governor's office. They also have what's called the cabinet unit, and those are the liaisons by subject matter. Again, seven or eight people who are the liaisons between the governor's office and the 200 plus agencies and departments, boards and commissions that we have in the state of California. And those cabinet folks are the ones who direct or uh, indicate what the administration wants out of those agencies and departments. So you have to think about that. So you're not just lobbying the agency staff or the department staff. You also may have to turn to the governor's office and say, look, governor staff, we need your help in persuading agency X or department Y to see our point of view here. Yeah, very important. Um, well, listen, uh, Chris, thank you so much for a wide ranging conversation on all things politics and lobbying at the state capitol. Uh, by the way, for folks, if they didn't catch all of the conversation, we will be posting it on our, on our website so you can and watch it, listen to it at a later date. I want to thank everyone for being with us uh, in 2023 and hope to see you again in, in 2024. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.